I'm Bob Connors, your host, and we have a special guest today. His name is Bob Welsh, and he is a former highway patrol officer and modern-day storyteller extraordinaire. And he's going to share with us some interesting tales and stories and give us an example of exactly what kind of work he does. Bob, welcome. Thank you. <laughs> Pleasure being here, Bob. It, it is really good to have you here. We really want to thank you. I know you uh, came a ways to get here. <laughs> yeah, I suppose about 60 miles, but that's 60 fine. miles? Yeah. Well, that's a bit uh, of a ride, but yeah. uh, we're happy to have you, and I'm going to share with our guest here, some of the, our, our friends viewing this, a little bit about what you do. So maybe you can tell us who you are. Let's start with that. Okay. My name's Bob Welsh. I, uh, I'm a Navy veteran, and after the Navy, I got on the highway patrol here in Ohio, served 29 years. Um, retired and presently live in uh, southeastern Ohio in Monroe County. Mm -hmm. And um, right now I kind of, uh, uh, just for a, I guess a hobby, uh, I do storytelling and I travel the country. Uh, I've spoken all over and in Canada uh, mm -hmm. doing storytelling on uh, values uh, and, and ethics for people. That, that's really fascinating, fascinating life you've had. And we're going to get into hopefully how you, uh, it brought you into storytelling. So maybe you can tell me how you actually got started with this storytelling idea. Well, I, uh, I'm a hunter and a bow hunter. And I've hunted all over the country, uh, elk and bear and deer and turkey and things <clears throat> of that nature. I've spent a lot of times around hunting camps. And... Uh, I would tell stories around hunting camps uh, that I had read. Uh, my mother, when she tucked us kids in bed at night, there were six of us, and she would uh, recite poetry to us, and most of it was from Robert Service. Mm -hmm. And he wrote uh, The Cremation of Sam McGee, The Shooting of Dan McGrew, The Ballad of Blasphemous Bill, and... Um, I, I was really intrigued by those stories, so I memorized some of them, and I would tell them around campfires, and then eventually got writing my own stories. Well, that's, that's yeah. a pretty interesting. Um, I think we have a trailer of uh, a tape that you have. Maybe we can run that trailer now and give the folks an idea of what Bob does. Heat. Black smoke and flame are filling the cockpit. The 18-year-old pilot's Avenger has been dealt a fatal blow by anti-aircraft rounds. He and his two crewmen must bail out and pray they can evade the Japanese who will be intent to hunt them down. Experience some of the action of battles in the Pacific fought during World War II through the eyes of George H.W. Bush as told to his grandchildren by his wife, Barbara Bush. The story includes our Navy pilots defeating the Japanese at the Marianas Turkey Shoot, the Battle of Leyte Gulf, and George Bush's rescue by the submarine USS Finback. Feel a sense of pride, patriotism, and humility as you get a first-hand account of how Americans rallied to fight two wars at the same time, halfway around the world from each other, and win them both. How our sailors, Pilots, soldiers, and Marines fought to avenge the attack on Pearl Harbor and establish stability in the Pacific. Realize how we owe our lives to the greatest generation our country has ever known. In Grandma's story, all of this history is brought to life in exquisite detail, captured in the oil paintings of artist Tom Stahl and set to verse by storyteller Bob Welsh. Well, that's uh, that tra that trailer just enticed me to, to want to see it. You have the video there. Uh, uh, yes. Can you show that to the folks? At sure, home? sure. To see, uh, this is uh, what he just looked at. There, you're a little bit higher there. There, there you, go. you go. That's the video. Is that available anyway now? Uh, well, it should soon be on Amazon. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think it's on my website yet, but uh, it'll be on Amazon pretty quick. So, uh, it's, uh, it's the story of the war years in the Pacific mm -hmm. of uh, George H.W. Bush as told to the gra his grandchildren by um, 
Yeah, there uh, it is. That's good. Okay, is that that That's better, better. Where, That's good. where you can, don't have reflection on it? But uh, this is the cover, and it's showing uh, George Bush parachuting after bombing the island of Chichijima and, and his plane getting shot down, and where he had to be rescued. And uh, it's it's quite a an interesting thing that covers a lot of history of the war in the Pacific. Wow, that's, uh, that's definitely something to remember, so folks might want to write that down. It's going to be on Amazon soon. Yeah. Grandma's Story, Bob Welch, I think it would be uh, worth your time to pick one up and watch it. I'm, I'm going to do that myself. <laughs> yeah, well, there, yeah, I worked with the, uh, an artist, Tom mm -hmm. Stahl, who has oil paintings all through it, and then I set the script to verse to follow Tom's uh, beautiful oil paintings. Yeah, well, that's, that's yeah. excellent. I'm, I'm looking forward to it. Yeah. Um, now we're going to go to your inspiration here. Where did you where do you find your inspiration? What well, sparks uh, that little thing that makes you want to sit down and write. Uh, it comes probably from three things: from uh, uh, from life, uh, things that I experienced while I was working, while I'm hunting, things like that. Uh, it comes from reading. Sometimes, you know, every night I usually read something when I'm going to bed, and then. It also comes from people like you, Bob. You, you'll give me a call and say, boy, I just heard something, and I thought, boy, could Bob Welsh put that to verse and make it sound good? And, and people will send me articles and things, mm. and, and I'll research them and, and then, uh, then write a story. And all my stories I set to verse. Mm. And when I say verse, I'm talking about perfect rhyme and perfect meter. And it, you can tell a story in perfect rhyme, perfect meter, and it will flow so smoothly, people will not realize they're listening to poetry. Wow, that's really interesting. Uh, we're talking with Bob Welsh, storyteller, and um, I, I, on this inspiration thing, let's stay with that for a second here. Um, is, that, is there something that comes up on you, your mind that you need to write this, that you're so inspired that it makes you want to just jump in and do this? Or do you have to work at it, work at it to get started on something? Well, it, it's always work, but uh, I've attended writers' conferences, and they always tell you let characters take a life of their own, and I can't do that. When I see something I want to write, I always write the last verse first. I know where I'm going. Here's where I want to end. This is let's call it the punchline. This is what will grab people and say, oh my golly, and it'll put the story all together. So I write it first, and then I start from my research, putting the rest of it in build up to that. And then build up, that's, that's just yeah. fascinating. Yeah. And I'm sure it's a lot of work to just Well, sure, do right, that, right. It's, yeah, some of them have taken many months to write. I uh, wrote one on the, uh, sinking of the USS Indianapolis. I had met a, a survivor from that ship and spent uh, probably six months with him. I'd drive over to Wheeling. Paul McGinnis was his name. He's passed away now. But uh, uh, he would tell me different things and then I would go home and write the verses and whatnot. Wow. Uh, yeah, that's, uh, I think that's always part of it about the work. And you say sometimes several months. An example would be how much time in that month you spend on that project. Is it eight hours a day? Or is no, it no, four or five no. Hours I use the best. The best part of my story writing is done in bed at night. I go to bed. I have my stuff laying there, and I, I'm I live alone, and this, so then I can just scribble, and I may fall asleep and wake up and have another idea and write it down. And uh, yeah, yeah, the best of them, most of them are, are written. Uh, when I go to bed at night. Oh, really? So when <laughs> yeah. you, that's when you feel inspired to right. just write. So you, sure. you just pick it up when you feel like yeah. you, you and, have and, and now and then, uh, driving. I, I might get an idea while I'm driving and have to pull in a rest area and jot some notes down on something. Yeah, well, that, yeah. That's interesting. Well, I write, but not, that, not the kind of writing you do. Okay. And, uh, and I have to research a lot to find what I want to get. Sure to get the story right, down, to yeah. get the, the facts together. And it takes inspiration for me to start, to, to get into it. I have to be inspired. Right, right. E even yeah. though it's often dull work. Sure. Yeah. I'm inspired to find something. Uh -huh. Do you um, ever get the sense that you want to find something in what oh, you're doing? Oh, yeah, sure. Yeah, that happens. That, that happens. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and eventually it'll come. You know, you, like I say, somebody will call or send me a, 
uh, a thing. A, a lady sent me a little article on a, a girl in 1777 named Sybil Ludington who rode just like Paul Revere did all night long. And I, uh, I thought, boy, what a, a great story that'd be. So I did the story, but you do not realize that the writer is a 16-year-old girl till the very last verse. All that time, you think it's a man that's doing this writing. writing it. Right, so uh, that came from somebody sending me an article. I went on the internet and found there was a book written on it. I got the book and researched it and then went from there. And then from that, you drew this sure. inspiration and just started. Right, this. yeah. <laughs> well, that, that's really interesting. Yeah. That. I think inspiration is a something really special in all of us. That right. we, sure. It, it, I yeah. don't even know if we understand where it comes from. No, but <laughs> I think if you pay attention, it'll it'll come out, it'll resurrect. That creative yeah. spirit right. just comes, yeah. comes rolling up. Sure. Um, I think we have a, you have a story that you can tell me. Of, that we oh, I, I, I think an appropriate one for this time of year. Why <clears throat> don't you tell that story I'll, and I'll listen. I'll, I'll tell you uh, my Christmas Eve. The hour's late, should go to bed near midnight, I believe. But memories keep me wide awake this snowy Christmas Eve. Yes, memories of my kids moved on. Each has their separate life. And how the holidays have changed since angels took my wife. The toys, the food, the Christmas cheer. My wife would bear the load because I would work most holidays. State trooper on the road. Just sitting in my easy chair, so many years retired, I reminisce on times gone by and all that has transpired. Of all the many happenings that seemed to come to light, a multitude of them occurred right on this very night. A drunken woman in Iraq who died on Christmas Eve it leaves memories of a tragic case most people don't believe. I had to drive to where she'd lived to tell her next of kin. I found the run-down mobile home she had been living in. The person answering the door, I still recall today, a a little girl, about four years old. She said, I'm Sue McKay. I asked her if her dad was home and felt the longest pause. She said, my daddy ran away. You must be Santa Claus. My mommy said you'd come tonight if I just stayed in bed and bring a pretty doll for me, just like my mommy said. I broke the law that Christmas Eve, did not call child's care. They'd merely put her in a room and that I couldn't bear. I picked her up and took her home. My wife tucked her in bed and wrapped a pretty doll for her, just like her mommy said. Adopted by a loving home and soon they moved away. I won't forget that Christmas Eve and little Sue McKay. Another bitter Christmas Eve, a blizzard to behold had left a family in the ditch, just trapped there in the cold. By grace of God, I spotted them all cold and gaunt with fright, drove them to a motel room to safely spend the night. One Christmas Eve, a homeless man, shivering and wet, was trying hard to get a ride I'm sure he'd never get. I picked him up and drove him to a diner on the hill to warm his bones and left him with a $5 bill. Strange how when you're all alone with memories you recall, you think of everything you've done and was it worth it all. I think about my God, my job, my children, and my wife. Would I do it all the same? Could I relive my life? Then comes a knock upon my door this late who could it be a neighbor or a santa claus come to visit me the figure standing in the cold gives me a sudden fright a trooper with that solemn look dear god who's died tonight i'm flashing back through bygone years and how i'd often stood on someone's porch to bring them news and it was never good is this how life gets back at me for misery i've induced where pain i've caused some other folks has now come home to roost but looking in the trooper's eyes, my mind is in a whirl. I see a pleasant countenance. The trooper is a girl. She smiled and reached to shake my hand, and silence wasn't broken till a tear rolled down her cheek, and then she softly spoke. I'm sure you don't remember me, but thought I'd stop and say, God bless you on this Christmas Eve. I'm Trooper Sue McKay. Oh, my. That's a... Uh... Yeah. That has me choked up. <laughs> oh, good. Oh. I just thought maybe it'd be appropriate for this time of year. but uh, it, it really is appropriate. Yeah. And what a wonderful story. Uh, uh, thank That's you. Absolutely wonderful. Yeah. I, I'm sure that uh, our viewers 
enjoy yeah. it every second. Yeah, of it, I, it's in uh, Embers from a Storyteller's Mind. Can you get a picture of this book, please? It, uh, Embers, there you go. That's Embers good. from right a Storyteller's there. Mind. Uh, they can find that on my website, bobwelsh.com. Uh, there are, uh, oh, I think about a hundred and some stories in here. Uh, yeah, I believe it. No, maybe 50 some. I'm, I'm not even sure how many I got in here, but uh, yeah. uh, there are uh, numerous uh, historical stories, uh, uh, some humorous stories, some uh, heart wrenching stories and whatnot, but they're all uh, like that. They're set and to that verse. That one is in there, too. And that's right? in there, right. It's, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, well, that's. Uh, the, that's uh, really touching. Now, uh, I understand you have another st Christmas story that you could tell us. Well, uh, let's see, a, a pretty appropriate one would be one I called uh, When the Organ Broke. Mm -hmm. um, the candles near the altar gave the church a solemn glow in Austria somewhere around 200 years ago. It was Christmas Eve and Folks strolled in, they filled up all the pews. But disappointment veiled the crowd because they'd all heard the news. The organ broke just yesterday. Could not be fixed for days. And how would worship be the same without their hymns of praise? The pastor, Father Joseph Moore, had stayed up through the night. He wrote a song of Jesus' birth to make this Christmas bright. So when the final blessing came, and they'd not heard a tune. Disappointment filled the crowd. It was nearly time to leave. Then Father Moore held his guitar and played by Vigilite, the song he wrote for Midnight Mass, a song called Silent Night. Yeah, messed up, messed up wow. a little bit in there, but that was uh, that, that that's in the book also. Uh, wow. And uh, that's the, the true origin of Silent Night by Father uh, uh, Robert Moore and and, that's, uh, uh, in Austria. You're a very talented guy. <laughs> uh, maybe you can tell us what special projects you uh, might be working on or what you have been working on lately. Well, the, the last was working with Tom Stahl on uh, this grandma story, uh, Heroes of Handsome Prince and Men That Fought the War. And I uh, um, spent... Uh, can we see grandma's story one more yeah, time here? Yeah. Yeah, I spent probably five years working with Tom Stoll uh, on, on this particular Heat. story. Black smoke and, uh, and flame are filling uh, the cockpit. We the 18-year-old pilot's uh, Avenger has been dealt a fatal blow by anti-aircraft rounds. He and his two crewmen must bail out and pray they can evade the Japanese who will be intent to hunt them down. Experience some of the action of battles in the Pacific fought during World War II through the eyes of George H.W. Bush as told to his grandchildren by his wife, Barbara Bush. The story includes our Navy pilots defeating the Japanese at the Marianas Turkey Shoot, the Battle of Leyte Gulf, and George Bush's rescue by the submarine USS Finback. Feel a sense of pride, patriotism, and humility as you get a first-hand account of how Americans rallied to fight two wars at the same time, halfway around the world from each other and win them both. How our sailors, pilots, soldiers, and Marines fought to avenge the attack on Pearl Harbor and establish stability in the Pacific. Realize how we owe our lives to the greatest generation our country has ever known. In Grandma's story, all of this history is brought to life in exquisite detail captured in the oil paintings of artist Tom Stahl and set to verse by storyteller Bob Welsh. Can, uh, can we show this? Can I see the, this? Maybe I'll put it right here if you could see that. I think, um, there you go, Grandma's story. I think this is something that Every, all of our viewers are going to want to see this. This is pretty astonishing. And the book uh -huh. as well. I'm uh, so impressed with it. Bringing me to tears is no easy job. I guess uh, I, I, it, I did uh, mention to did. you that uh, I have a CD that also goes with this, if anybody's interested. Same thing. It's called Embers from a Storyteller's Mind. But there are 27 of what I feel are the best 
stories in the book are on the CD two discs yeah. in it. Yeah, yeah that uh, that is pretty uh, pretty amazing. Um, one more thing, can you tell us about the the documentary? Um, is that this? The, the, yes, yes, yeah. This, this is, is it, and and it started with Tom Stahl. Uh, had a neighbor who was on the San Jacinto in World War II with George H.W. Bush, mm -hmm. and he was the one that asked Tom if he would draw uh, or do an oil painting of that ship and take it to a reunion. And Tom did, met President Bush, gave it to him. Uh, as I understand, that painting is in the Bush Library, mm -hmm. but that's that was the impetus behind this whole project on doing the war years. On, uh, did, how long did that take you to put that together? That's well, pretty Tom, amazing. Well, Tom has worked on the oil paintings for 20 years. Whoa. And he got a hold of me about five years ago and wanted to know if I would write the script in verse. And so uh, I've been working with him for about five years and we just completed it, so. Wow, that's, yeah. a, that's a, amazing. I will certainly yeah. have to get a copy yeah. of that myself. Yeah. That might make a, a wonderful Christmas gift for somebody sure. to give to somebody they love and want to give them something right. special. Sure, and then we still have World War II veterans walking among us that uh, would love to, to get a glimpse of that and see it, that would remember oh, I that. I bet, I bet that yeah. would be incredible. Well, hey, what an honor, Bob. Well, thank you, I appreciate that, Bob. Uh, thank you uh, for joining right. us. Yes, sir. We'll be right back. Well, Video and media technology have changed dramatically over the years. At ESV Teleproductions, we have the knowledge and the latest equipment to complete your project that will be a cut above the rest. The next time you need media produced, call the award-winning professionals in St. Clairsville, Enchanted Sound and Video, ESV Teleproductions, 740-695-5289. Welcome back. Um, it's time for a little commentary, and um, I hope that you'll find this interesting. I'm somewhat taken back from our guest, Bob Walsh, uh, who did a fast, fantastic job. I hope you are not just tuning in and you missed that. That was incredible. But uh, today's history, Upper Ohio Valley, likes to offer you some interesting things you haven't seen elsewhere. But this evening, what I want to talk about in my commentary is something that we're all watching with the uh, at our border something that I don't think any of us ever thought we would see with people charging the United States of America's border to the tune of 15,000 people and there's so much spinning going on in the media that I thought I'd bro boil down the facts so that we can look at this with the facts and not with the emotion that we're being driven by with many people in the media so invader or asylum seekers, what is it that we're looking at here? Now, what the law says, and I'm going to quote the law on asylum seekers. First, an asylum applicant must establish that he or she fears persecution in their home country. Second, the applicant must prove that he or she would be persecuted on account of one of five protected grounds, race, religion, nationality, political opinion, or a particular social group. So let's run through those quickly so we can all understand what these people have to say to get into the country. Um, first, there is no religious persecution in Honduras. They have freedom of religion as we do, and so that's not an issue, so none of them will be able to claim that one. Racism is also not an issue in Honduras. Nationality is not an issue in Honduras because all of these people are Honduran born and their nationality is all the same. Political opinion. 
There are eight political parties in Honduras, and you have to, anyone to choose from. None are being persecuted or targeted at all. And the last is social group. And there would be very few, one, two percent possibly, that would qualify under that one. Now, there also is no war in Honduras. I have friends who live there and have lived there, and they tell me there's no war. Now, they, they don't have the best jobs in the world, low income. Uh, life is not as good as it is in the United States, but that's not reason for asylum. So what does this mean? Well, the vast majority of asylum seekers do not qualify, but once the, of all the ones who come to the United States wanting to get in, but once they cross our border, they know that they can disappear and never show up for a court appearance. And that's what they do. It is like sneaking into a ball game and then staying there and not paying your, your ticket and just stay there forever. That's kind of what their people are doing when they run across our border and they want to see a judge and then they disappear and nobody finds them again. Uh, international law. It's, the international law says that would-be immigrants must seek asylum in the first country they reach. In this case, that would be Mexico. That's what international law says. The Mexican president, Enrique Peña Nieto, said that the migrants wishing to obtain temporary identification documents, jobs, or education for their children could do so by registering for asylum in southern Mexico. Well, there was the asylum that they say they seek and offered to them by the president of Mexico, and the migrants refused to register for asylum in Mexico. So they said, no, we don't want that asylum. Migrants were organized by professionals and open border operators who are all over the world, actually, and they don't believe that there is such a thing as a border. People should be able to go wherever they want, and no borders matter, no country matter, no laws matter. And the question I have for this is it's costing millions of dollars to get 15,000 people across that much area. Who's paying for this? I think that's a question that should be answered. Who is paying for this to find out why they would be doing such a thing? Now, border crashers using the same tactic, tactics that Palestinians use by placing women and children in a dangerous situation so that they can make some propaganda videos. They do that in Palestine with, against Israel all the time and also in other countries. Our media is complicit in these propaganda videos, which is an effort to tug, <coughs> excuse me, to tug at our heartstrings and make us feel sympathy for these people. And we do have sympathy for them. It's a sympathetic situation. It's, you don't want to see anybody in that circumstance. But that is not the problem. That is not what we how we have to look at this. This whole thing is being staged and orchestrated. Now, if we, let's say we allow these 15,000 people to ignore our law, abuse our immigration system, then the next group will get the idea they can do it. Well, what do we do with the next group that comes, which is probably going to be 30 or 40,000 people? Then what do we do when 30 or 40,000 people are at the border, they put a couple of women and children up front, get some videos, they make us say, oh, that's just so sad, let's let them all in. Well, when does this all stop? When does it all stop? <clears throat> Shouldn't we be protecting the people who are standing in the legal line to immigrate into this country? What about the kids there? What about the kids standing with mom and dad waiting their opportunity to get into America following our laws? Should we just turn our back on them and say these other people are more sympathetic so we'll let those people jump the line and get in and disappear and we never find them again? I think not. Now, I'm going to show you a video, to, so in case you haven't seen it, much of what you see on TV is very carefully selected to cause you to feel one way or another. I have some raw video of what's happening on the, vid, on the border, and I'd like to show you that right now. <laughs>
Now, I'd like to uh, ask you a question. You just watched a video of what's going on on the border. Did you see a bunch of little women, kids and women at that border, or did you see a bunch of young men attacking, throwing rocks and bottles, and ignoring our law completely? It, is that an invasion, or does that look like asylum to you? That, just be honest about it. Does it look like an asylum situation where they're asking to get in, or does it look like they're trying to break in as an invasion? I think you know the answer to that. Do asylum seekers attack the border in mass, throwing bottles and projectiles? Is that what asylum seekers do? Do asylum seekers ignore the law of the host country? Is that what they do? America has the most generous immigration system on the planet, bar none. There are 37 million legal immigrants in the United States right now. 37 million people in the United States right now who are new immigrants. That's a lot of people. We allow one million people each year to come to our country and immigrate legally. One million people a year. Is that not enough? It's more than any other country does by far. The people at our border, what they want to do is jump in front of the people who are standing in line with their kids, trying to do the right thing, follow our law, and take care of their kids, and be a good role model for their kids. Now, the people at the border are teaching their kids, if you want something, throw bottles and rocks and break in to get it. The people they want to jump the line on are standing in line patiently to immigrate here legally, so that they can become American citizens and enjoy their life here. That's the difference. So when you see these sympathetic videos that some of the media people are trying to show you, just remember what they're not showing you. The people who are standing in that line legally with their little kids, they're holding the hands of their little girls and boys, and they're showing them how to come into a country properly. In my estimation, that's the kind and sympathetic thing to do, not to show your kid how to be violent. That is not. And feeling sorry for people trying to break in is not sympathetic either. Because it, what does it do to the people who are coming here legally? Let's just have everybody start throwing stones and run in, and nobody has to come legally. We'll erase the border. We don't need a wall. There need to be no borders. America means nothing. That's the message that's being sent to these kids that these people dragged here from Honduras and ignored Mexico's generous offer to take asylum in Mexico. Now, we do not, um, do we forget the law and order because the border is stormed? We just say we don't really have any law and order here? Is that what you want to do? We already have 13 million illegal aliens in the United States right now, and it's probably a higher number than that, who broke in or came in and said we're going to disappear, and most of them nobody even knows where they are. So this is the group that's building. How many of those do you want? How many millions do you think would be good before you would get a good feeling about what's happening? I think that's a question we all have to ask. The American people have a right to demand that anyone entering our country be identified and approved and go through the proper channels to be here. We need to know who's in our country. That seems to be so simple. The American people also have a right to safe and secure border, no matter who wants to come in or how sympathetic they are. We have a process, and they're welcome to use it. No one is blocking anybody for any reason from using our legal process. That doesn't happen. It's time to end this invasion and build the wall and restore order to the border so that every American can continue to be proud of this country, and without a border, there is no country. I'm Bob Connors. I'll see you next time. Enjoy your evening.